Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome author and historian Jeff Curdy. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. My gosh, there's a lot of you. Um, I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. I appreciate it. And we're in for some fun this afternoon. You know, costumes is... To me, it's interesting because it's sort of this untouched area of Disney. You know all the projects I've done. I've done a lot of historical overviews. And for almost 100 years, Walt Disney and his creative heirs have engaged in every storytelling medium. They've brought global audiences, iconic and significant, and in many ways, really immortal culture. And across every medium Disney has touched since those early days of animation through live action filmmaking and the pioneering efforts in television and the location-based entertainment and retail and even gaming, there's this one creative aspect of Disney that's seldom documented and it's ever present, which is costume design. We've seen and heard and read so much about artists and animators and performers and composers and designers and Imagineers who have brought Disney to life for generations and millions around the world, but costuming has never had its work examined uh, or apprised or appraised or appreciated with the same focus, nor has their art been as celebrated as their creative contemporaries. You know, there's a certain attitude and there are many of you here will understand that it's just clothes. Um, we're here to show that it's not just clothes. They're a significant, they're a memorable element of building a character, of telling a story uh, as any other creative or technical aspect, script or sound or performance or production design. And with this year, we're correcting that oversight. Uh, as you know, there's a wonderful major central exhibit here at the D23 Expo and a companion book. And to talk about that, we've brought together several of the key figures who created these pieces. Becky Klein joined the Walt Disney Company in 1989, joined the staff of the archives in 1993. Hello. And we were, just, we were just talking about this backstage. I think Becky and I met the first day you worked at the archives, I right? Did, yes, so, a long time ago. It's amazing because I think you were seven yeah, and, and I was you nine. You were 12, I believe. Yeah, I was, no, I was nine. <laughs> but she's the director of the archives, and you've seen Becky around today and have seen her on, I was in my hotel room watching the morning news, and there was <laughs> Becky. So my guess is she either has a cot somewhere in the back yeah. or just doesn't sleep during Expo. Yeah, that's it. But her job is collecting and preserving all of the aspects of Disney history and making that material available. And one of the key things, too, is making it available to us, to make it available to the fans and to the people who love Disney's culture and history. So in addition to historical documents, artwork, character merchandise, costumes, props, memorabilia, costumes. Sailing ships, sailing chariots, <laughs> thrones, a little bit of everything. We've got it all. <laughs> well, we try. But, but archives has really sort of ramped up. Yes. In that sense, because its original boundary was really, in many senses, a document. Yeah, it was a historical, historical repository. Historical repository. For the most and part. a lot of the use, most people don't know this, a lot of the use was really for business affairs, for legal. It was mm -hmm. to double check contracts, to right. look at billing, and what did they do on the original release. Exactly. But you've sort of expanded that, and one of the areas that you expanded into was into this notion of sort of showing this stuff off. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting. My opinion has always been, why collect the stuff if you can't share it? I mean, it, so we have this amazing collection in the archives. And, you know, my thought was, well, how do you share it? The easiest is to share it in an exhibition. Mm -hmm. And so we started exhibiting those materials to the fans, like you know, yourself, who, who love it the most. And it gave us an opportunity to reach out and do some outreach to the fan community mm -hmm. by doing these exhibits. But you started off with, a, it, it was like everything. There's sort of a ramp up. There's the baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> so when Archives opened in its new facility in the Frank G. Wells building, this was sort of the... 
That was the front window. That was sort of the marquee of the archives yeah. in a way. And that was to show off some real gems of the collection, the iconic stuff. So perhaps the uninitiated might go, oh, that's oh, yeah. what that is. Yeah. And then you started to add to that yeah, we, we took those cases and, and updated them. Uh, one of the biggest exhibits we had done to date was this exhibit. Um, it was the 50th anniversary of Zorro, the 75th of Goofy, and the 25th of Epcot, all in the same year. <laughs> so we, we did a, a three-pronged exhibit. We were so proud of that. That was major for us. And, and once again, as you see there, the um, costumes are a prominent feature of that exhibit. Yeah, you know, we only had 15 costumes when I started uh, doing this project. That's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> we Our, now have multiple thousands. I remember back in the old days, it was like, it was Annette's cape from Babes, Babes in Toyland, Toyland uh -huh. that got put out a lot. And of course, yeah. the Mary Poppins Mary Poppins, costume. Zorro, the Davy Zorro. Crockett's cap, mm -hmm. and Bobbo the Clown's vest from the Mickey Mouse Club Circus. For, for we all love and know <laughs> Bobbo the Clown. He's dear to my heart. Okay. okay. Well, then you got some more cases. You were talking about yeah. this, and once again, you've done hats, you've <coughs> done shoes. shoes. You <laughs> were very going narrow cases. somewhere with that. <laughs> well, there wasn't a lot of room. They're not, they're not very deep cases. We got some space in the in the lobby, and I thought, well, I'll just wrap some cases around the elevator. There's some space they'll give me. And I thought, what are we going to put in this thing? It's really N tiny. Little narrow thing. So I thought, well, we have a lot of orphaned hats in our collection. So we've got full costumes, but we've got a lot of shoes, but not the costume or the hat, but not the costume. So I thought it would be really fun to just do a hats off exhibit. So that was, that was an early one. But once again, as you sort of going up the ramp, going up the stairs, each D23 Expo, mm -hmm. there's been sort of, it's sort of the cornerstone of the show floor to me. Yeah. That's like yeah. the big historical cultural monument that's the, the, the keystone of the whole exhibit floor to me because yeah. I'm a nerd, so, you know. <laughs> and we've had an exhibit at every D23X, but we, even from the, the very first one in 2009. Yeah. But they've gotten progressively bigger, and a few years ago they kicked us downstairs and gave me 12,000 square feet to fill. And so we did Disneyland uh, for the 60th anniversary of Disneyland. We did a big exhibit and then followed that up last time in 2017 with the uh, Pirates. With the Pirates. Yeah. And then, of course, you've done external exhibits as yes. well that are not yeah. essentially purely Disney things. Treasures yeah. of the Walt Disney Archives, you all might have seen it at the Reagan Library or at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Right. Uh, they started here, and then we, you know, they loved them so much they asked us to bring them there. And you took it to Japan, too. Yeah, Treasures we did. We started doing Treasures in Japan. The exhibits are huge in Japan. Yeah, right? they, they've been traveling nonstop. Every, every other year we do an exhibit in Japan as well. And then that travels around the whole country of Japan. I think the last one we did is finishing up in December, but it's gone to eight or, Robert knows, eight, eight cities, I guess. And the fans are crazy about our exhibits in Japan, so we just keep doing them bigger and bigger. And you've done expos in Japan, so you yeah. have, that's a component of, of that. Yeah, big fans. As, as well. So let's get specific and talk about the costumes a little bit. Let's bring on our next panelists and just talk about how a costume becomes an archival piece. Oh yeah, how it as becomes opposed fine to a, art. As a working, a working wardrobe, <laughs> just clothes. Yeah. How just clothes turns into an archival yeah. uh, asset. So uh, let's welcome uh, our next guest who joined the archives in 2008 as a researcher in the photo library. And since that time, he's helped to curate, install, and deinstall <laughs> archives exhibits from Chicago to Tokyo, and he works in collections and acquisitions uh, yes. as the archivist in that area. Please welcome Rick Lawrence. Hey, Jeff. How are you, sir? Uh, okay, how are you? I, I might also you. add um, very quickly that the fabulous, my strongest suit opening montage oh, his idea. was his concept and what can I say? Love the song, had to use it. What can you say? So that's as interesting to me as I have a theater background and I still do a lot of work with Disney Theatrical. You have a theater background. I do, I studied theater. You have a theater background. Yes. <laughs> I wonder why these guys like costumes so much. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> There's a jillion costumes. You know, you were saying early on that oh, yeah. the archives had, how many, what, how many we 15 we costumes? We had one to begin rack with? that had about 15 costumes on it. But now you have, and now we have 
We have a warehouse full of costumes yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Once again. Thousands. Yeah, racks and racks of costumes. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what's the methodology and the logic in acquiring those mm. elements. I mean, uh, what's the What's the checklist for you in looking at what becomes an archival costume? Well, I think the first thing that we always look for is something that is iconic. Mm -hmm. I know it's hard to predict what's going to be iconic, right. but for me, it's looking at a costume um, without the actor and out of context, and right away you can still tell who that character is. Mm -hmm. I think we could all look at Mary Poppins, just hanging on a rack and know that it's Mary Poppins. Mm -hmm. That to me is iconic. Of course, Jack Sparrow, and Cruella de Vil goes without saying. You can tell who that is right away. Yeah. And I think the bell gown uh, was iconic in the animated film. Yeah. So now to come along with a live action film and to actually have a physical dress there is just incredible to have But you go collection. across all media too. You do films, television, even parks, parks. and resorts. Parks and resorts, yes. So and Broadway a, as well. And Broadway, yeah. yeah. We start with a wish list usually. We yeah. watch the movie and then Rick and I usually talk and I'll say, okay, these are the ones I think we should get and he pulls out his list and they're usually <laughs> the same list. And that's the ones we say, we want these. These, you know, and, right. And, pull and each, each one of those mediums is a little bit different in mm -hmm. the acquisition. We do have a wish list. Uh, with film, the production wraps, and it's all right there. And television, sometimes it could be one season. <laughs> or it could be Seven Grey's season. Anatomy, which is going on and on and on. Yes. And when Grey's Anatomy goes off the air, we're going to no, be taking it's, it's not. months to collect <laughs> costumes. Apparent, tell, tell them about Once Upon a Time. It's, it's yeah. not going <laughs> Once Upon a Time, yeah. Rick had to go to Canada for Once Upon a Time and look at all, what, eight seasons? Yeah. Yeah, at the same time. So it's easy to put together a wish list, but then if you get an opportunity to go visit the set and these wardrobe closets, there are so many other things you forgot about that you're not thinking of. And the whole time you're going, oh my God, there's one more costume. There's another costume. And then he says, oh my gosh, she wants the car. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, in, in terms of parks and resorts, do you look at cast member wardrobe? Do you look at entertainment costumes? Do you look at all of it? We what? look at all of it. The parades, uh, the cast members, everything. And especially like with cast members with seasonal changes, yeah. there could be a winter costume, there could be a summer costume for the same attraction. Mm -hmm. And so whenever those switch out, we're always reaching out and saying, okay, we'd like to have at least one of uh, the old ones one of the male and one of the female mm -hmm. to, to keep in the archives. So it's, it's a constant hunt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the art for those, the designs, Rick exactly. always we collect, asks for uh, designs as well. Any, as much of the concept art as we can get for those, mm -hmm. we try to hold on to those too. And with film and television, the continuity books that go with it, because those actually show the steps, that shows every piece within that costume and the steps to go through to put it on. Because sometimes we receive these and there's, you know, 20 pieces Where in this, this period costume and it's, okay, which is number one, which is number two? The costume puzzle. Yes. Because yes. the, the Cinderella blue gown has like 10 layers, which one is first and which one is second. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's always right. I was going to say. <laughs> and unfortunately, Sandy Powell is rather expensive to bring over to <laughs> Seoul to Saturday. But, you know, the designers sometimes have come in. I mean, I remember them coming in the first time and showing us how to dress the Jack Sparrow. Penny Rose came to the archives and said, this is how you do it. Yeah. And we, we filmed her putting it together so that we knew exactly how to do it. And uh, now that's Colleen an Atwood has done that for us, That's too. an archival record. That's yeah. really interesting. Sure it is. Very interesting. Yeah. There's one that you brought up, which I thought was really fun, which is another reason that you... Uh, will keep a costume, even if it's not a terribly interesting costume. Mm -hmm. And the example that you brought up, I just love. <laughs> yeah, sometimes uh, a show could just be a lot of suits. And in the case of Mary Poppins Returns, um, it's a wonderful suit, but do we need another dark suit to put on display? Well, of course we do, because Dick Van Dyke wore it. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a cameo, but yeah. we had to have it. And even more importantly, we don't have anything that Dick Van Dyke wore in the first film. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. So this was not going to get away from us. <laughs> <laughs> now this is an interesting, you had sent me some photographic records, for instance, this, uh, this first Of my photo. office. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, and... <laughs> It is. <laughs> it's, it's essentially your workplace. My office before, it? yes, my workplace. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, the top photo there, that is uh, loading dock. Oh, no, this oh. is where we're on this. Oh, now we're on this. Oh, I'm sorry. 
<laughs> this was one of those opportunities of visiting the set. This was, what show is this? This is Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Okay. And so took a visit to the set one afternoon. So this is what you walked in and saw? And saw. This is okay. one of the many rooms okay. of wardrobe that they have. Yeah, see, they don't come on mannequins. And they don't come on hangers with labels. Yeah. Get that out of your head. They come in giant e-crates, and they're never organized. Yes. But this was an example of walking in and having some idea of a wish list and then seeing all of these other things. Now, this so, was how you received. This is how we received. I, is this Mary Poppins? I think returns. this is Mary Poppins yeah. Returns, yeah. yeah. yeah right. Which, of course, we were like, we want something from all of the main characters. <laughs> yeah. And all of the main characters have two or three changes. <laughs> and so you want all of those also. So then you end up with all of these crates arriving. And sometimes the costume is all together in one place, and sometimes the shirt might be here, the pants are over here, the blouse is here, the skirt is there, the hat is in another box. So again, with the continuity books and the character list, you're able to go through and at least understand all the pieces that make the complete costume. But then you're going through six different crates to make sure you've got all of those pieces and pull it all together. And then so it does help if you're good at puzzles. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and you get everything, too. Yeah. So you get everything. Everything. Accessories. Shoes, belts, hats. Shoes. And well, I say everything, and of course, there's always an exception. Sometimes with some big films, jewelry and pieces like that will be rented. Rented, yeah. So occasionally we'll get the necklace. Sometimes we won't. Um, this is interesting. The shoes in here, I don't know if you can read the tag, talks about them being uh, shoes to yeah. walk on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> so we have other pairs of the exact same shoes, but they have the heel. Heels on them. But they made a duplicate pair without the heel so that she could walk much more easily in uh, other circumstances. One of the things that I love, too, is the details that you discover, which is Sandy Powell. I was, when I did the Mary Poppins book, she talked, about the, she talked about the iconography and how intimidating it was. And I loved one of the touches. She decided instead of the daisies or the cherries. Cherry or blossoms, else, yeah. Mm -hmm. She said uh, she just kept remembering that robin from the mm -hmm. first movie. <laughs> So all of Mary Poppins' hats have a little bird on them, and that's her homage to the original film. So you discover layers of storytelling, too, as you collect the costumes. Involved, and, yeah. and it's fun to connect with those designers and get information from them and get insights and backgrounds. It really does help you as a Well, as it a helps us, as, yeah, as archivists to know the history behind the piece and the creativity that went behind it. It makes but, it all more important. But once again, your theater, your theater, the idea of a costume exhibit was probably never very far <laughs> from your... It's been event. around for a while, I have but to admit. But here was the opportunity with this event. Right. And so um, let's just take a look at the... Has, who's seen the exhibit? Has, yeah? Good, good. Okay, well, the, those of you who haven't yet, this is like a really good primer for you before <laughs> you go see it because it's, well, no, it's great because you'll know what to look at and what to look for and so on. So I'd like to bring out um, our next guest. And um, he's been with the archives for just under five years. So he started in January of 2015. And since then, he's assisted with the curation and development of domestic and international exhibitions for the archives. And he serves as the exhibition manager of the archives, and they oversee the loans and displays as well as helping create the exhibitions or working to create the exhibitions. Let's welcome Robert Maxheimer. <laughs> Mister. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see ya. <clears throat> Sit by me. I would love to. Thank you. <laughs> oh. So this is where we talk about when you start an exhibition like this, this is, for those of you who are familiar with Marty Sklar, he used to talk about the blank sheet of paper being the most terrifying thing in the world and the great opportunity. Yeah. For this particular exhibition, this is pretty much where you started, if I'm not mistaken. That's right, yeah, we start with uh, a rectangle and um, we build from there. So it's, it's a rectangle and a, a basic idea, which was, <laughs> hey, we wanna do a costume ex exhibition. And, but what you develop into is you start to fill that, rec that rectangle and you choose your costumes based right. on your spaces. You develop a storytelling logic. Tell us a little bit about sort of that whole. Well, like, like I said, we start with the idea that we want to do a costume exhibition and then we, we build from there. Um, we do an exhibition brief, which breaks down uh, an overall theme. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, we... Um, decided with this one in particular to dive a little bit deeper into the art of the Disney costume. So the, the costume designers and really 
kind of uh, focus on their process and what they do, and mm -hmm. um, uh, it's and, and it, that was a really interesting uh, process. It's a great layer of, yeah. of richness to the story that I, right. I just I, like I said at the very top, you don't get to hear these stories very often. Right. And they're not very. Yeah cohesively documented. Right. And you tell stories with every part of the film. It's not just the script or the actors. Mm, absolutely. You're, you're telling stories with the background, scenic painting. You're, you're telling stories with lighting. You're telling stories with costumes. The art props, direction, the art props, direction. props, the light. It's yeah. like, there's so many different things. So ultimately, you are sort of looking at what your costume inventory is, what your, mm -hmm. in many ways, don't lie to us. You're looking at some of what your favorites are. Of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And what we don't normally get to you know. show, you know. Yeah, so, and that's, that's true. Well, and then, of course, I think you start to drill down into what's interesting for them to look right. at. What story can be told right. with a costume? Yeah. What background can they uh, enrich their experience with? I think that yeah. I have seen the exhibit. <laughs> so um, it's, it's, once again, the, the layering of storytelling that has been developed over this. And once again, you, you chose this sort of larger thematic, too, which I think is an organizing principle that actually helps the audience navigate through. So you start in the front with sort of a, a pre-show. Right, yeah. We, um, in the past, we've had um, uh, exhibitions where you just uh, you enter in and it Flow in. kind of flows through. Uh, with this one, we kind of, you know, the way that a lot of attractions are in the parks. There's a pre-show area, you load in, uh, and you're able to kind of get an idea of what you're about to see, like a prologue. Um, and we took this opportunity to, to showcase the Cinderella ball gowns, which we have four of, uh, from four different productions and four very unique designs. So it was, it was very cool to be able to set these vignettes up um, and introduce not only uh, the designers, but what costume design is, because a lot of people don't know what that is, what mm -hmm. that process is, and then, um, uh, and then go from there uh, into the main gallery. Yeah. And once again, the layering in that storytelling, too, is we all think Cinderella, and I think we all get a picture in our heads of what that means. And to me, it was really interesting to look at these individual designers and look at what were their criteria for making that design, or how intimidating is it to go, oh my gosh, I got to <laughs> do Cinderella again. Yeah. Right. What do I take forward from what's been done before? Where's my light? It's like the Colleen Atwood was a whole sort of Completely different, different take yeah. on it. It's, it's fascinating to see, for me, what the design choices are and why they make them. And right. I think that this uh, area, this pre-show area, really helps set it up. Now then, in terms of navigating a storyline within, instead, once again, of dumping into a large room, there was a, an effort to put forward a sort of a thematic Pathway, I guess. A thread, if story you will. Know. A, a storytelling thread. Oh. <laughs> Come on, the jokes don't get better than that. They don't, no. <laughs> We've been rehearsing for months, so. Mm. <laughs> We've got this down. The, the slam dunks come later. <laughs> but once again, you just, as, as you just said, you start with that uh, design studio, basically, is right. your thematic approach in right. there. And you do this as sort of the, the case study of what's that ball gown about. Right. Um, and once again, each designer has a very different take on each of those. Then as you go into that main room, you have divided it into sort of villains, heroes, and kind of people who are both and not either. And heroes, heroes. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So you can see the, the, the scope of what's on display there is, is an enormous number of costumes. Right. I'm always total. fascinated just by spatial organization and visual organization and how you make right. those decisions. One of the things, for those of you who haven't seen the exhibit yet, you plug your ears because they're spoilers, but <laughs> there's a really, it seems a very intentional, high fashion cleanliness, elegance to yes. the way Very that this simple. Is story is being told. This Straightforward. Is simply, you're letting all of these costumes speak right. on their own terms, mm -hmm. which I think is really fascinating. And the lovely thing about the way we've done it is that there are no barriers between you and the costume. We're taking a lot of risk there. <laughs> Thank you for behaving we're yourselves. Watching, we're watching you. <laughs> but we, we really thought it was important to let people get really close up to see the costumes and to see the details without barriers. Right. And that was a conscious decision. <laughs> so, so behave yourselves. Okay. Thank you.
It's you know, a, yeah. you know those signs that say "Please do not touch." That actually does mean you. <laughs> that also means you can't try it on. I think yeah. that's right. that, so. I asked, and they just wouldn't let me. Now, there is something. There is something to the to not having the barriers up. And I went to an exhibition that was a motorcycle exhibition that had these vintage, beautiful bikes out, and no barriers, no stanchions, nothing. And there was something like the curator or the designer was, was trusting you mm -hmm. to get that close. I think that's good. And there's a certain respect. And what I've noticed through today, being down in the exhibition, is that there, it's a mutual respect and people are not trying to. I think that that in terms of, in any kind of real sort of storytelling or experience, I think that people feel that. I know I feel that. I look around and go, I'm being trusted. Right. And it does kind of make you behave. You're mm -hmm. like, it, it's kind of a, it's an oddly grown up way to go. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> now the other thing that you've got some uh, elements of here that I always love in exhibits and I love when it's done, I've, once again, I, I kind of love what's been done here, which is media. You were able to go to these four right. Cinderella designers mm -hmm. and have a conversation. Once again, it's sort of this layering of design insight and their method, not, just their approach, but a lot of subtleties that maybe as an audience you don't notice in the costumes, but they inform you as an audience. You feel a lot of the right. things that they, t but you get them sort of on camera and talking about that. I wanted to show a, a couple of the clips from the interviews that you, that you were able to do. Yes, I suppose that the transformation scene was something that I had to think about how, how does the dress happen. I mean, I knew that the visual effects department were going to take care of that. But um, one of the reasons I came upon the idea of using butterflies as part of the decoration was I was thinking about how the transformation would happen and the Cinderella we've already established is at one with nature. She's friends with the animals. And I thought, you know, it'd be quite good if maybe the butterflies land on her dress as part of that scene. The butterflies come together to help make the dress, as it were, land on the dress, and then they became part of the decoration. So that was my little contribution to that moment. Um, but definitely I was working alongside the visual effects team all the way through, really, with not just her transformation scene, but when the fairy godmother appears and, and how the, um, the mice turn into horses and the lizards turn into the footmen and stuff like that. So having uh, that kind of access to these designers for this, I mean, this is really a, a special window right. into this, beyond just <clears throat> getting to look at the costumes. You get to carry this extra insight. Of course, I'm really pedantic, and I thought, oh, butterflies, because she's transforming from humble, ugly caterpillar into beautiful butterfly. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, about a kindergarten level and that kind of stuff. So. Um, let's look at what another one of these uh, uh, terrific interviews. The Woods and Into the Woods is one of the characters in the story, in a sense. The Woods is a reference to the Woods in our minds, in our souls, and in our lives. So for me, the, the Woods and the, the texture of the Woods, the colors of the Woods were, were definitely kind of starting points. Um, the Wolf's costume, for instance, was almost like a wood pattern and a fur pattern combined that I had embroidered on silk and then made the suit out of that. Cinderella's costume was, was reminiscent of the silvery leaves of a willow tree in the wind. So there's little references all the way through the movie that sort of refer back to a kind of woodland world, per se. And that's understanding the working methods of these designers. What do you think about? What do you approach? Once again, another thing you don't get from just looking at a costume and why exhibitions can really reveal so much. The other thing, of course, is we all love the gossip and we want to hear the star stories. Yes. So you've got, got a little bit of that as well, I think. Whitney Houston was involved in, in the beginnings of pre-production. She went on tour, I believe, during the during our pre-production stage. So I would send her sketches and um, make corrections or listen to her notes and and um, get everything together for when she came back and when she was going to be with us. Uh, she had absolutely the overview of what we were planning to do, 
And um, when she came in, she walked into her costume and came out and sang. What, it doesn't get better. I chose gold because it was a beautiful compliment to Whitney. Her, it, we actually, because we had Klimt, the director, um, Rob Iskov, he was a very, very big fan of the Klimt idea, uh, Gustav Klimt, the painter. And it was, they were gold layers and gold geometrics and everything had a very rich and um, kind of Art Nouveau glamorous feel to it. And he had said, can we absolutely do that gold somewhere? Where should we do it? He, then I seem to remember him saying, I would love it on, Brand, on, on Whitney. Do you think we could do it? And that's, that's basically the reason why. In creating costume displays, of course, you know, once again, I'm the low grade guy. You throw it on a mannequin and make it crimped up and make sure it's clean, get the coffee stains off of it. You guys are a little more sophisticated than that. The storytelling too, you went to sort of a new direction in terms of displaying costumes that I think is really fascinating and very Disney. Uh, not just putting them up there on a department store figure, but you had a different uh, new tech that you were able to use. Yeah, Rob took care of that. Yeah. Tell them about it. As far as the, the mannequins, yes. So we worked with a great company called CNL. Um, they have uh, these giant 3D printers uh, at their factory in China. And um, we worked with them uh, and their designer. And I would send them a still, uh, and they would render it in the computer. And we would go back and forth, and then we would get the actor's measurements uh, and make it exactly the way it was. So with a lot of these, we used uh, for the, the middle section of the exhibition where it was the hero versus the villain. So if you enter into gallery two, the heroes and the villains, there's some minimal customization on the mannequins against the wall. Uh, but the center is really where they come to life. Uh, and that, that was kind of the goal there. So it was a lot of fun. It was fun to get them when we finally did because it took about six months. Yeah, the beast uh, mannequin is insane. Right, yeah. It's huge. Uh, it's, it's full scale exactly the way the beast would be if he was alive. Now, in creating an exhibition, then you, everybody sort of does their thing. But then, of course, you're always in communication with each oh, other. Yeah, you're always working together as a team. But then there's a point in the actual f creation, fabrication, where your, your work starts to sort of merge. And this is the, the uh, visualization right now where you're beginning to, uh, is this where I get up and sing bit by bit, putting it together and doing no. the strikes? No, it is not. Thing? Yeah? <laughs> no. Because I got half the audience could sing along with me. For most likely, know. yes. But this is really that part where everybody sort of comes together in the storytelling in each of their roles, in each of their crafts, and begins to assemble this into... Yeah, frankly, these two guys do it, and I stand and point a lot and give notes. The best job to have. It is the best. <laughs> she is great in 30 notes. years, I got that job finally. <laughs> I'm still waiting. I have applied for senior vice president of sitting by the door and picking up a paycheck, but it never yeah. seems to open up. I just, that's my job. I want that one. No, really, if, if I could just for a second. She, yeah. it, this wouldn't be possible oh. without her. I'm serious because she gave us the the rope to both, you know, hang, hang ourselves yourself. or or to uh, <laughs> pull to, yourselves to make this up. happen. Exactly. Yeah, yeah and uh, it, it wouldn't have been possible. There's a lot of uh, leaders out there that, that wouldn't do that. So. Thank you. There's a lot of trust, and I think I think that that's the experience that I had with the, the creation of the book too. Was yeah. there was just a lot of trust. Yeah. It's like yeah. you you know, mm -hmm. you, it's great when you work with people who kind of just know what they're doing, and you go, yeah, let's just see where he takes this because right. he's. There's a 93.5% chance he's going to be exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> and if he messes it up, you just get to yell. That's right. <laughs> That's why I've lost my voice. You can tell. <clears throat> so down there on the left, yes. there as the dress is getting put on, you see that hardworking lady right there? With her keyboard, sitting we just on, put sitting on the floor. We just put that. That's her office. <laughs> that's her office. She gets yeah. a she gets a floor and a laptop, 
and we just wanted to, you know, embarrass her a little bit because we love her. Um, so let's bring our final panelist out, though. She joined the archives in 2014, and she specializes in the rich photographic assets of the company, both historical and in creating uh, current images as a digital producer for Walt Disney Archives. Please welcome Holly Brobst. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thanks for being last. Of course. Anytime. <laughs> we put her last because she's most important and the youngest. No. So. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> so photography is a component of this exhibition. It's a, it's a huge component of the archival process of costuming. Mm -hmm. So just give us a sense. Rick gave us a sense of how the acquisition happens. Um, how do you do the accessioning? Is photography a part of accessioning into your collection? Do they provide photo documentation from the productions? <laughs> what, do you, what do you got? Or is it all over the map? It's all over the map, and it yeah. varies. Um, when they initially come in, the only photography that's done is me and my iPhone, or my iPhone and I, yes. however you want to look at it. I think there's a song it's just, in Yeah, there should be. My iPhone and I. <laughs> and that's just taking a quick snapshot of what the wardrobe is, what the mm -hmm. pieces are in it, and noting if there's damage to them mm -hmm. so that we know down the road what they came in as, and we can compare that with later things. Once we decide it's going on exhibition, then the master has to step in. <laughs> now, do you do any further documentation, or is it just case by case as needed? We really should, well, it's like you said, if we need to know that this is piece one, this is piece right. two, that kind of thing. Right. We have so much stuff that it is sort of like as needed. Um, so a lot of the costumes were shot specifically just for this project because they hadn't been done in that fashion before. Mm -hmm. So. When we had 15 costumes, we were able to shoot them all when we got them. Yeah. But you but didn't have an iPhone. That was several yeah. thousand <laughs> costumes ago. <laughs> That's because I thought you were going to say it was several thousand years ago. but It, it only... feels that way, exactly. but it's not really. So I think each costume probably you have, I think what we're looking at is sort of a standard issue, sort of a, a straight on kind of regular photo yes. that we might expect to have. But in, for those of you who have been to the exhibit, looking at each one of these costumes, I was just looking at them and thinking, oh my gosh, how do you photo document something when you get into material challenges, lighting challenges? You look at a piece of something like that's time. Yes, that is his sh shoulder piece. Shoulder pad, I don't know what it's shoulder. technically called. <laughs> They're epaulets. Epaulets, thank you. Big epaulets. Big epaulets. <laughs> big epaulets. Giant epaulets. I think that's the technical name. That's a capital B, big epaulets. <laughs> I like it. That photo kind of shows you the uh, differences in lighting, how it changes the object. You can see the interior, what it's built out of. And as the light changes, it shows more or less of the fabric. The detail. So. We used a lot of detail shots in the book, but we also, if you look at the, at the wall that goes around the exhibit, all of those detail shots were done by Holly. Mm -hmm. That was one of my favorite parts. Holly and her giant team. <laughs> yeah. How big is your team? <laughs> <laughs> this is the thing that absolutely stuns me about what the archives does as a regular corporate collection and then what they do like this and your team is it, it's so small <laughs> it's true but once again I think you have a lot of sort of polymath talent too yeah. you have a lot of people who can do a lot of different things and oh, yeah. I don't think that there's a sort of rigidity of roles in terms of it's always all hands on all deck hands on when deck. it comes time yeah, to do a big exhi exhibit yeah, right. exhibit like this one you know the the people that are answering your questions down there or, or tweaking a costume are archivists and you know secretarial administrative people, right. they're photo technicians, they're, you know, just the whole group, everybody is there helping. Over my Disney career, and I know you probably share this, is a, that's been kind of the fun of it, is those all hands on deck projects. They really make you feel sort of energized and involved and, and important to, yeah. to what's going on. So. And everybody's very um, positive. I, I feel yeah. like everybody's on board with what we're doing. And when they're not busy cool. engineering each other's downfalls and stabbing them <laughs> each other in the back, right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, 
<laughs> it's, it's very funny because we deal with a lot all the time, all of us, is sort of a lot of the rumors that go around and all that <laughs> stuff. And I read some of the stuff like online and go, oh, if only there were enough hours in the day after getting work done to do all of these shenanigans that people <laughs> think go on behind the scenes. It's like, you drag yourself home after 12 hours and go, I don't think I got it all done today. <laughs> yeah. you know? This is another one of those detail shots. Once again, I think a lot yes. of, of what, what people will see on display and what people who own the book will see is a lot of your attention to this. The selections that you made in terms of photographing detail, what was motivating? Was it just people will never be able to see this again? Or right. I really like this? Or a lot of that? That one for Miss Who is my favorite. It's yeah. so detailed, the de the, all the beads and the, the I don't even, it's the ruffles on the side, right. the color yeah, and the, the texture of fabric. the fabric. Um, most people don't get to see that close up. Yeah, you don't see it on screen. It goes yeah. by so quickly, mm -hmm. yeah. but well, it's just beautiful. And that's what I thought about Mrs. Who's skirt. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I never saw it that yeah. way in the yep. film. You and see the colors and the shape. And the, but and the, right. and the movement. Right. There's movement to right. it, I think, that was part of the design choice, yep. maybe. Mm -hmm. yep. And what's the... on the? Uh, this one is from uh, Narnia, the White Witch. White Witch. And that one kind of shows also the, the difference lighting makes. Um, shows, brings out the detail more, uh, moving the light around. Yeah. So I just like to focus on stuff that people wouldn't normally see. One of you guys, because somebody asked me when I was showing the exhibit last night, one of the performers said, what is that way, the one on the left-hand side? Is that as heavy? It's not as, as heavy as you might think. I mean, it, it Because it, it looks heavy. so layered. and It is yeah. heavy. Mm -hmm. I was surprised when I put it on that it was fairly lightweight. <laughs> But it's because you had the right shoes. <laughs> that, uh, it's all of the shoes, no. right? It is not as heavy as it looks. And the difficulty with that one, and even the White Queen, is storing it. Yeah. How do we right. transport it? And how do we then store it for a long period of time? Right. Because it's not something you shove in a wardrobe bag and yeah. hang on. Well, and the White Witch has that fur. Yeah. Too, too, which yeah. is a whole other beast when you're dealing and with textiles. And it's very textiles. structural. Yeah. yeah. And so you can't, you can't crush it. Right. You can't hang it. Yeah. You can't let it stand there on its own. What do you right. do with this thing? You can't leave it on a mannequin because eventually the seams fall apart. Yeah. Because yeah. you do wonder how the performers even wear these things <laughs> on set and walk and perform in them because right. a lot of them are very rigid and. Heavy. Oh my gosh! Every time I watch The Wizard of Oz, I'm like, how in the heck did these people dance yeah. in this in stuff? These things. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, that's, once again, another reason why costumes are always sort of, and it's one of the things in terms of documenting this stuff that I really like, is I always like a subject where I'm, where I'm really curious about mm -hmm. how it's done. And once again, that's to Holly's work, what we got to do, which we that hadn't been done before with the Expo exhibits, right. is, was bringing together a companion book. Mm -hmm. And this was really interesting, I think, because, of course, books take a long time. <laughs> Books take a long yeah. time to make. And well, and exhibits take a long time to yeah. make. So I think we got a pretty good early start. We did. And I don't know what we would have done if you didn't exist. Yeah, I, I got mean, permission to do a costume exhibit at last Expo's exhibit. So it was two years ago. Yeah, this, I said, I want to do a costume exhibit next. And it was like, yeah, go ahead. So the idea of putting together a companion book mm -hmm. uh, came about right, right then. Yeah. And you had been a big fan of some of the things that uh, Lucas had done with. Yeah, the, there's a, a book called so Dressing that. a Galaxy, which is just gorgeous. And that then uh, is about the Lucas film. Deborah Landis so. had just done the Hollywood costume, the Hollywood costume at the costume Academy Museum. Museum. And so there's a lot of costume in the zeitgeist at that point. And then, of course, the uh, perpetual uh, component of Expo with cosplay and mm -hmm. now with mm -hmm. uh, Disney bounding. Yeah. This is a subject area that's so important mm -hmm. to, the, to the fan community. Yeah. So it, it all sort of seems like a perfect storm in a certain way of being able to do this. Um, and Holly did all of the photography. She did that, it, yeah. And that's, that was all. really, Gorgeous. really to my Seriously. point is the Dressed book, it, shot it. The book would not exist if it was not for you and your gigantic staff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And staff. I have to tell you, <laughs> there are page spreads in this book that you will just stop at for 
half an hour just <laughs> looking oh. at the photograph because there is such exquisite work um, in terms of how that's all been documented. So the reason we brought you on laugh last is so we could lavish praise on you and embarrass you as well. <laughs> and for making you sit on the floor. For you sit on the floor. <laughs> They're going yes. to, I think that if there's enough money left after the costume exhibit budget, you'll get a chair. Do I get a desk? No, no desk. No? That's okay. Whoa. Now's the time to ask for that photography Can I get a studio. Desk? Yeah. Don't, exactly. don't get greedy, Holly. <laughs> Her I think photography just studio is next to my desk. It is, yes. it's true. <laughs> I feel bad when I shoot because he just gets blinded constantly. And if you saw our No Before You Expo, you see somebody taking pictures of the costume. That was Holly. Yeah. That was my cameo. What I think is really interesting to me is, I, you know, I'm a lifelong Disney fan, and I went insane seeing Mary Poppins when I was six years old, and it led me to create a career that makes my mental illness appear less frightening. Um, <laughs> was I always had this perception of this giant, sterile, hospital-like environment at Disney <laughs> where everything is so hyper-engineered. And, <laughs> and you come to find out it's a lot of really passionate, committed, mm -hmm. interested people, most of whom, if they weren't sitting up here, would be sitting out there, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's sort of that whole extension of the tribe that is us mm -hmm. because we love it so much. So you do find somebody without the glamorous photo. Don't tell anyone there's not a glamorous photo studio <laughs> at Archives. Buy lots of books and there'll be a glamorous photo studio. Tell, yes, please, yeah. please. And tell everybody that you got to hear about the glamorous, high-tech, cutting-edge photo studio at the Archives and all of that. But I think for us, too, one of the best and most satisfying things about what I do, and I'm sure for all of you guys, is being recognized. And I think everybody enjoys being appreciated, and that's in large part to the reaction that you guys have to this kind of thing. But I think it's sort of fitting to end our conversation about this subject with a, a comment from the costume designer of Once Upon a Time, Eduardo Castro. I'm so excited to have the costumes from Once Upon a Time uh, in the archives over at Disney. It means so much to me because uh, these were costumes that meant so much to a lot of people. Um, I've never been on a show where the fandom was uh, so amazing and uh, the letters that I got and uh, uh, people really related to these costumes. And it's so many times uh, costumes are made and uh, then they become disbanded and dis you know they, they, they're sold off and, or they're auctioned off and then they get lost into a certain world and it's it means so much to me that the archives have kept these things and uh, kept them for posterity and hopefully they will be enjoyed by uh, other generations and other people to see because uh, I'm so proud of not my design so much, but the work room, the work that was involved in creating them. So I hope that gives you some insight and background on the exhibit that you'll see here. If you haven't seen it, I hope you go to it with a whole new appreciation of what it all is, what it all means, what's all behind it all, and the people who worked really hard to <laughs> bring it all together. So thank you to all of you for being here. Thank, thank you, you for so coming. Much.